Okay, we're gonna cut an accelerator on demand video about the way that we have been collaborating together to both form a group called Bowline and to connect Bowline to CBS. And what we're gonna talk about right now is why we did that and what it stands for. So we should introduce ourselves first. My name is Eric Guthy. I am an associate professor at the Copenhagen Business School. My name is Matt Orlando. I'm the head chef and owner of a master restaurant out in Resolute. And I'm Victoria Parker. I'm a master's student at CBS Business School. What we want to do is invite you into the conversation that we're going to have about the way that we've been working together to create new kinds of learning and impact. So uh, the way this whole social movement started, Matt, I've heard you talk about it before, but you yeah. describe it in a really compelling way. I mean, it, it started with just a casual conversation or, or I'd say maybe a conversation um, between myself and Christian, just talking about how we could support each other. And mainly we're just talking about each other and Christian was kind of reaching out to me about how if I needed any help being a non-Dane and, and then we, we started and then and then he we started having some interesting conversations and then he respects you a lot so he called you up and said hey maybe we can get um, Eric involved and create a different dynamic to this conversation and, and actually something come out of it and then before you knew it there were about eight of us mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. and we it went from having a casual conversation about what we could how we could help each other to talking about how we could actually help the industry mm -hmm. and that went i think from when we started the conversation about how do we gather information to when the survey actually went out was yeah. about 10 days so describe a little bit uh, as background and context what it was like to be an owner of a restaurant and have the covid crisis hit you in the face i mean I think I can speak for most restaurant owners is that it was it was scary. Mm -hmm. Mostly, and, and most fear is based on uncertainty, and mm -hmm. this whole thing was an uncertain moment in time for all of us. Yeah. We knew we just had to close. Um, we did it a bit early as a responsible thing to do, and then government mandated it. And when you close your restaurant, we, this restaurant's never closed outside of vacation time. And when mm -hmm. you close your restaurant, you're standing in the middle of your restaurant, and you're just kind of looking around saying, this restaurant might never open again. Yeah, that's how uncertain the time. I mean, were. and that, I remember, especially early on in our conversations, we kept talking about how much we didn't know about what yeah. was going to happen. Exactly, and that was why we needed to figure out how to learn stuff. Yeah, and that was the way we came up with this idea of a survey. Actually, it was focus groups first, because so, you had been in some focus. Groups. I had been in a really interesting focus group where it was myself and another chef, and then fifteen consumers. Consumers being people that aren't in the industry, and just they just like to go out and eat, and we were given the opportunity to just ask questions to these consumers about what their feelings would be about going out when everything started to reopen. Mm -hmm. Just so we can gauge approximately what we could expect and how the best way to go about reopening would yeah. be. Um, from a staffing standpoint, from a, a logistical standpoint, all of that from a safety standpoint and just really gauge what where people were. And that was, the amount of information I got out of that was amazing. And then we started talking about, okay, maybe we should do one of those focus groups. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we said, well, let's do a survey first. Exactly. And all of a sudden it, it went crazy. I mean, we got you guys involved. So we got five student volunteers from CBS involved. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Eric just put out the call, said we need some help. We're going to be working with all these really cool restaurants in Copenhagen to see what the industry is doing. I personally was so interesting to see how you guys would reformat and re-strategize uh, in what was happening around the world and come out of this. And um, Eric picked a group of us who had some experience in surveys, uh, and we knew that we wanted to get the public involved and elicit the information that you were, you were looking for. Um, and it, we just hit the ground running, right? Yeah. Actually, really fast. The, the, when we met to get the survey up for the first time, we met here in Amas, and that was the first time I'd seen anyone except my wife in person uh -huh. since early March, basically. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> and then we put up the survey, and within 72 hours, we had something like 4,500 responses. Yeah. yeah. Every, every time I say that number to somebody there, that has, especially in, in the academic world, they're like, whoa. I mean. It was crazy. We were What did you guys, like, what did we the were like, say? We hope we would get 100. And yeah, then yeah. Yeah. two days later, there were all of these yeah. uh, responses. And we ended up at like 4,800, um, just over that, cutting it off. And 
um, now we've got a couple more going out, which is really We're translating exciting. it into several other languages. Yeah. But what we realized was that we had tapped into something really raw and really, uh, I mean, people were really cared yeah. about what was going on. Mm -hmm. It really, it also showed how hungry people were for information. Yeah. And, but it also showed how willing people were outside of the industry to support. From mm -hmm. all over the world, which too. Is, which was crazy. And it also showed that this, kind of what we all put together in that short amount of time, it also made me realize how much of, now we have a bit of a responsibility to to kind of kind of tap into that base we have already yeah. and, mm -hmm. and kind of keep this thing going. So we also realized that it was, the cool thing that was happening was that we were collaborating in really interesting ways. CBS, CBS, me as a CBS faculty, CBS students, we got other faculty involved because those two colleagues of mine actually, because I don't have any chops in statistics and two of our colleagues wrote an article that analyzed our data for us. And so what we're realizing is that we can keep doing this. And with CBS as, you know, well, the, the title of our survey was a seat at the table. And basically now we all have a seat at this table. We're trying to figure out how to harness the energy of what we sort of unleashed to literally create new types of learning and new types of engagement. So what we're hoping to do is work with you guys. Absolutely. And we've talked about this before, yeah, we but have. it's I, weird how we have this almost a year ago we were opportunity this. to yeah. do this now. Yeah. It's, I mean, I think, I think that, uh, I mean, we can talk about this later, but that opportunity within, I don't know, chaos is something that I've come to really yeah. respect over this, yeah. with this whole process. And, and we, we've applied that to, to the restaurant, definitely. I mean, long term, we have this idea that we'll get literally have new types of learning where CBS students will be in classes with people from the restaurant industry. Yeah. Not just as teachers and students, but as collaborators yeah. around different, because that's what we've been doing here, basically. It, it's really interesting to, as, I mean, the restaurant industry is not notoriously uh, well known for being responsible business operators. <laughs> I mean, we, we operate with such small margins. Be careful and, and, what you say. And we tend to, <laughs> and we tend to um, make decisions based on um, the experience of the guest first, mm -hmm. and then figure it out financially on the backside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And because that's just what we do, we, we take care of people. That's that's part of that's the main focus of our job. So sometimes that overshadows the uh, a decision based in financials and then you kind of you back I mean so you're selling I mean don't sell yourself short because here's the thing CBS has expertise of that sort mm -hmm. a lot of if not me my colleagues do but the restaurant industry also has ways of doing things and collaborating and uh, an understanding of service and the experience that you create that a lot of companies would kill and, to get a hold of. And, and that's what I'm really interested about this collaboration because I, in the past at other restaurants I've worked at, we've actually done team building programs mm -hmm. where you'll have a big a bank and their top executives come in and they spend a day in the kitchen yeah. just to see how we organize ourselves. And, and that, that kind of person to person connection in a restaurant tends to be much stronger than a lot of other industries yeah. because we're just inherently look out not only for our guests but for each other and, and our staff and so I'm, I'm curious I'm really excited to see how those two this kind of service minded part and business minded part come together because it's something I mean in the last couple of years I've really been deep in the numbers for the restaurant and yeah. which has been really eye opening in a lot of ways and but it allows you to make decisions that you necessarily wouldn't have made in that way before. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm just excited to dig deeper in. So Victoria, what's different about this type of activity we're doing, the classes you take at CBS? There's such a litany of stakeholders involved here. We have chef owners, we have academics, students. I know we're engaging um, businesses, especially in and around Copenhagen. And the government. The yeah. government, I mean, it's, it is real life. Um, and it takes what you are supposed to be learning in the classroom and it makes you think on your feet and to know that there is no one cut way to come out of this. You've done it one way, other businesses have done it another. Um, and the learning involved in this is so much more fruitful. What has been the most surprising thing? Honestly, uh, the amount that the public was willing to get engaged 
and so quickly and on such a deep level. So many people have reached out to us from different countries wanting to replicate this and all these things. That really shocked me um, and how quickly and how nimble your restaurant has been on its feet to come through this crisis um, into something different. Yeah, and I don't think this collaboration would be the same if we would have done this a year ago. I think the fact that the cri- yeah. that, because the crisis you that yeah that CBS yeah. has engaged the industry, the restaurant mm-hmm. industry, in this particular moment in, in time is special. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. I think you're gonna mm-hmm. see a much more dynamic um, thought process because people are all out of their comfort zones right now. Yeah, which yeah. I, it's a great place to you be. You have to be. It makes you new things exactly new innovations, new ways of working. I'm Eric Guthy from CBS, and this is an Accelerator On Demand video about resilience in the face of the COVID-19 crisis. Guys, introduce yourselves. My name is Matt Orlando. I'm the head chef and owner of a mass restaurant in Rastadu. My name is uh, Christian Hildegard. I run two places in the city, uh, a wine bar and a restaurant. Um, yeah. So we form part of a group called Bullvine that is formed of uh, chefs, restaurant owners, friends, scholars, and now a burgeoning uh, collaboration and partnership with CBS uh, in which we are trying to figure out ways that both the restaurant industry and uh, the university can learn in new ways from the crisis that we've been facing. And at the beginning of this crisis, the three of us sat around on Zoom and started talking about what the hell was going on and what you guys were going to do about it. And eventually we formed this group called Bowline where we've grown and are growing more and more all the time to involve more people in that conversation. But we want to invite people in this video into this conversation to talk about the way that you guys have adapted to the crisis and literally had to change the way you do business. So Matt, we're sitting in a room that you've changed around completely, so tell us yeah, about drastically. that. Well, when the restaurant closed, you you kind of look around and, and you realize what you have and you, you kind of see you start to question what you've been doing over the last seven years, and you look at, I know, for me it was a surreal situation standing in an empty room mm-hmm. um, with everything shut down, knowing that we didn't know actually when we were gonna reopen, so we shut the restaurant down in a, in a pretty serious manner. And um, we started to kind of look for information about what's gonna happen when we reopen, how is it going to unfold, and we took a step back and said, first and foremost, if we are, if we're going to survive this thing, we need to stop saying two things. That's not in our DNA, and that's not what we do. Because I think in a lot of restaurants, you develop an identity, and you are you are so bound to that identity, and you're afraid to to kind of veer off from that path in fear that people who are coming to see you will be like, well, I came here for this, and now I have this. What is what is that? And, that way of thinking, I think, within the restaurant industry is dead. There are, right now, we all need to be nimble. And I think a very important thing is that we've made a lot of, we've made a lot of changes internally um, and externally within the restaurant to survive. Um, but these changes, we have to be nimble as well because we don't know what's going to happen over the next year or two years. Mm-hmm. So I think that that ability to operate outside of your comfort zone yeah. is a must right now. You're changing in the context of constant change. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Huh. And we have we have kind of, you know, if you would have asked me seven years ago if I would be running a wine bar and fried chicken spot out of the exact same room that a mass exists in, I would have said, you're, I don't know, what, what are you been smoking? So you <laughs> took this room, which was all a mass, and you basically devoted a little... 40%. I mean, half of it, forty yeah. percent of it to AFC, yeah. a mass fried chicken. Mass fried chicken. How did you come up with that idea? Well, mass fried chicken has always kind of been in our DNA. We, being American, fried chicken is something I hold dear to my heart, and we've we've been doing the fried chicken as pop ups in the garden, different spots around town, and stuff as a as something to kind of break the everyday um, cycle of just running a, an upscale tasty menu restaurant. Mm-hmm. And I think everyone kind of really gets into it when we do it because. Yeah. We wear shorts and t-shirt and it's not like regimented like normal services and so that's something that's been in our back pocket and we've developed a bit of a cult following around that chicken yeah. so it's good when when this came about when this the current situation came about it was kind of a it was our 
It was we had it in our pocket. Yeah. And, and like I said, if you would have asked me if this would have been like a, a permanent thing, I think I think I would have said no way. And so when I say permanent, a lot of a lot of people are adapting and doing things on a kind of temporary basis just to make it through this. At first, this started out like that, and then when I saw the room and I people started coming for it, I said to myself, "This is this is permanent. We're gonna yeah. keep this because it almost." It almost was like we were forced into something, mm -hmm. but it actually showed us that that was what we were supposed to be doing. It felt, I mean, we were here on the first day. Yeah. It felt really right. Oh, that was a nightmare. It was a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> Very much in control. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, we're, now we're in control. We were definitely out of control on that day. Yeah, it was pumping. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. pumping, man. It was like mm -hmm. a festival. <laughs> yeah. And it's going strong, is it, right? It's going strong. It is, it is the reason we're able to survive right now. Because in a mask, we have to have a certain distance between tables, which allows us to only have a certain amount of guests, which is not the amount of guests we need to survive. Mm -hmm. So by doing AFC, we are, that is what is actually helping, making or allowing us to survive. And what's it like to, what's the vibe in a high-end restaurant that serves yeah. amazing food like when you've got people eating fried chicken literally on the other side of that shelf? For me, for me, it's amazing because it it makes people s s over at a mass stop taking themselves too seriously. Okay. And sometimes people, when they come in to eat at a fine dining restaurant or an upscale restaurant, they just take themselves way too seriously. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go out of our way to make that not happen anyway. We got hip hop on and graffiti all over the walls. Yeah. And which which helps us a little bit. But sometimes you just like, you know, you're you're out to eat. Relax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at that guy over there. He has a face full of chicken and brownie oil in his face. <laughs> so, I, I, for me, the vibe is something I wasn't expecting to embrace as much as I am right now. Yeah. And so, it's also, there's 50 people outside eating fried chicken in the garden. And you have some, uh, a couple that are dressed up really nice with their really fancy gla glass of wine. And they walk out in the garden and there's kids putting chicken in their face. And I just yeah. love the opposites and how they, they play with each other. I was here one day when both were open and I saw this guy come in to eat over here and he had this giant grin on his face about <laughs> the way, it, about the interaction between yeah, the two. Great. Really I love to hear that. So, but Christian, how have you had to change? Uh, no, we have two spaces very close to each other. Um, uh, a wine bar has been for on the 11th year now mm -hmm. with a, a strong pool and a restaurant. We've been open for four years but we've been you know, really uh, working hard to make it uh, a sustainable business model. And we was just coming out of that. Mm -hmm. um, did a seminar in January with all my staff. A lot of focus on, on teaching and developing my staff as the key resource in our two businesses. Um, so we were kind of full on and hired extra people, start building up for, for summer comes. And, and then obviously uh, COVID happened. Mm -hmm. um, I was a bit of a shell shock. Yeah. Uh, so first, first thing was to find out what is this? Um, and Personally, my ex-academic side, military side, had a party with it. The rest of the tour got very drunk very quickly. Uh, <laughs> but the academic side said, okay, this is interesting. So mm -hmm. how can we take a, um, a potential, you know, dire, both health-wise situation, disaster. Yeah. disaster, into something that actually could spark a new change in mm -hmm. stuff? Because when you run a business for a long time, as you said, man, as well, you get into some, some habits, you get into some things in the comfort zone, and, and even when you want to do something, change, uh, it's very difficult. If your staff are in their head, you're already you know, working full time, and, and changing that is very difficult. So, a good crisis, put, uh, in, in quotations, uh, and yeah. you, uh, you need pressure to adapt. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously, as we discussed many times, this might be a bit too much pressure, <laughs> but it definitely means you need to adapt. Um, so, so our, our first focus is first to find out what's going on, how is our staff doing. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way we can, you know, how do we, how do we, what do we do? So the first 14 days was kind of a what? Um, but initially that process, we also look at that saying, you know, so liquidity wise, the biggest threat to restaurants on the short term basis is liquidity. Yeah. And, and the crisis will show how vulnerable we were. Um, and we also saw how, you know, even though government did, you know, spend this job locking down and start doing relief packages and all that. So just timing, you know, we're working on, you know, really a, a weekly daily, sch daily schedule where society was working in a more monthly and had obviously a focus somewhere else. Yeah. So what did we do? So we stayed at a web shop and, and that's how- The two like, ducks. The two ducks. We had two ducks lying outside on a pier. 
looking very tranquil in the situation. The rest was like running, like running around like headless chickens and and shouting what the fuck. And then these two dogs just lying there saying, "Dude." So it has to become an image for us and an idea about a understanding this crisis in a more tranquil way, understanding mm -hmm. um, what we're building now. It's not necessarily for survival right now, but it's actually building a product that we can use down the road. Mm -hmm. So, so what we very quickly find out that we're not doing things to survive now, we will sort that out somehow, but making things we can sell down the line, half year now, one year, two years. So instead of doing, you know, what, we, what you also said, doing frantic things just to survive now, mm -hmm. because that will be, you know, it might help you right now, but it, it, it actually is kind of productive for surviving three months now, three yeah. months, four months, you might as well take the difficult decisions now. Yeah. So I have to be able to create a space where we can actually make decisions which were more sound. Um, at least we thought that. But I, I think we're okay there. But it, so, 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 so we did the workshop, which you know for us sounds, you know, for other people start up saying workshop, yeah, yeah, well, we'll do that and those things. But we did everything ourselves. And we are, as you know, we know, I don't know, um, using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or building websites and all that is not really in our core competence. Mm -hmm. But we have no money to hire people. We have no, you know, so we had to do it all by ourselves. So that was a very You became process. a webmaster. Yeah, we it was fun. <laughs> and you know, also, you know, we used to work a lot. We used to be very actionable in our industry. And suddenly, basically, being, you know, put in the box, yeah. uh, like wow. an ice hockey game, put in the box for, you know, like, in different time, yeah. then you start climbing the walls. So personally, I, I spend time learning to make websites because that's my mental hygiene. Um, and then in discussing a lot with you, <clears throat> also to have ventilating, you know, ventilating about things, understanding the business and understanding the market, yeah. uh, most importantly. And, and also that's why we had Yvonne from, from UCL mm -hmm. in London coming in, because he was writing up a lot of, you know, very... Uh, <laughs> yeah, very dark. Yeah, yeah, but he started that before that, yeah. writing this uncertain mindset. So the whole idea of how adapt, yeah. adapt to change and all that. So suddenly it became, you know, besides you know, a, a, a creating a product, it also came like an exercise in understanding what do we need to to change. Yeah. Um, and that's also why we start talking about what we're doing now as well. Um, so the webshop helped us out, and we just started out for a few few weeks now to find out what is it we're doing now. The initial format was very good for, for the months when we were in lockdown. Now we need to find out what do we do with that for the future now. Yeah. So just uh, having a, um, put the handbrake on a bit and finding out and then seeing is there any other things we can do. Yeah. Because obviously we have scarce resources. You know, we, we only have the hands we have available. So we don't have a resource department. We don't have, you know, the money to buy in uh, external consultants and all that. So, so we also need to make sure that we, when we start doing our, our key business restaurants, just Stop a bit, and now we actually this morning before coming here discussed how do we build on this. Yeah. Um, as is the other ideas, and that comes into you know kind of finding out all the knowledge we actually have for the industry, you know, especially in our own places. How we can kind of, how do we can monetize that? Yeah. Um, so there's a completely different area from what we normally do table service, but is that is is that can we put that in the bottle and sell it? Or can we quantify it and, and do somewhere else? So suddenly from being you know, maybe our core industry or being you no know, table service and the service we do now which is very profitable for us now, is that a byproduct in the years to come? Because we need we need to uh, I, I think everybody on, on around this table know we need to adapt and this is gonna happen again. Hopefully. Well let's talk about that. Let's talk about how you use the word dark. Let's talk about how dark things could get and I mean, the need to adapt comes from the fact that businesses are going to go bankrupt. Their businesses are going to close. Yeah. So, as owners, how do you? How much have you thought about that? And how close to the edge do you get? And you know, when do you make a decision to shut down? I mean, I, that that reality became very real last night to me mm -hmm. when one of my best friends I grew up with uh, he moved to Florida like five years ago, and Florida opened up. He's a he's a brewer and his brewery is in a restaurant and Florida opened up, everything was going and he just texted me yesterday, he's like, they just shut us down and we don't know what, because Florida just shut all the restaurants and bars yeah, again. back again. And yeah. so now everyone is reeling and like, okay, we had a plan, but now we have no plan and now there's no help. Like mm -hmm. what, what's gonna happen now? And so, and, and he's freaking out and that, that just was kind of a, 
a reality check to say, hey, everything's fine and dandy now. Mm-hmm. But what is what is the backup plan? Like, mm-hmm. What what happens if if everything shuts down again? I mean, our our I mean our immediate plan is to take the fried chicken spot and kind of exploit that as a takeaway slash delivery. Um, but outside of that, it's kind of what do you do with the rest of your staff? Mm-hmm. We only have two to three staff that work over there, and we have ten staff that work over on the mass side. Mm-hmm. So then you're at a point, okay, what happens with that staff? And how, how does that staff, how can that feed into possibly AFC? How can it feed into, is there a product we make within AFC, the hot sauce? <laughs> we were thinking about how do we, how do we, is that something that's, can you model that? Yeah, but isn't there a delayed reaction too? Because the uncertainty is compounded by the fact that you have to change now. Mm-hmm. But as you explained to me, the situation is getting really bad in like nine months, right? Well, yeah, January, December, January, February. I mean, we're even looking at, so January and February is, is probably, well, February and March is probably one of the, two of the slowest months of the year. And we're looking at, okay, we have to get, you, all our employees get off, get to be on five weeks a year. Yeah. Um, so instead of closing, we're actually thinking about actually closing the restaurant down for that kind of, half of January, February, mm-hmm. all of February. And then, because we would, we don't know where we're gonna be at, but those those, those months potentially could be really, really bad. And usually your business, 80% of your business in the summer is foreign tourists. Foreigners, yeah. yeah. So and what that's is that? And, that? and that's not gonna be, and that also is true within the winter time as well, because it's all these, and that's what really helps us keep going in the winter. Mm-hmm. I mean, the way the restaurants work in Copenhagen is that you make all your money in the summer, and you either break even or lose money in the winter. But right. you made that money in the summer carries you through to the next season. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And where are we going to be at the end of the summer? It's fine and dandy now, but is this a, it's just this people's initial reaction of, I've yeah. been locked up for two months and I want to go out all the time. And, and so this uncertainty of what we do. So instead of trying to be uncertain in the very slow months, yeah. knowing that we'll probably lose money, if everyone is on holiday, let's holiday pay we can just shut the restaurant down, lose less money, mm-hmm. just we lose our operating costs, rent, stuff like that, mm-hmm. and then kind of mitigate our losses during those. That and are the economics time. the same for you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, the dynamics of what we make money is a bit different, but, uh, but it's, it's definitely that. Um, I, I think for us, it's been very important to, to um, create a base for flexibility. Uh, because as I said, you know, we might have a project now, but I, do we have the hands to solve it in three months? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so staff is key in our industry. So, so that's why, you know, uh, for us it's been very important to create flexibility within the individual, yeah. as a group, so we can, uh, can, can quickly can just, um, um, uh, track if we need it. So we normally we, we close the restaurant down during the summer because it's an indoor restaurant and we have the charities with the run bar next door. So, we focus all energy there, and then we have you know a month off in July. Yeah. Uh, this year we decided to be open because obviously uh, there is a um, idea of you know liquidity, um, visibility, um, and just you know get moving parts. You know because people have been on vacation already, but some of them have been at home, so we need to boost mm-hmm. that energy. But I might you know this morning I said depending what happened next week or so. Mm-hmm. Because summer holidays are starting then, mm-hmm. we might, you know, we might put a plug in the restaurant and close down for a month, and then send you all on vacation. So, so, but that's an, and, and that's very uncertain for, for uncertain. staff, and to create that flexibility and create that overhead, that's the biggest resources for us right now. So that's why now in the short term, it has to be highly adaptable yeah. to to what we know. As you know, worst case scenarios in, around the world now is that society is closing down in Denmark because it's been fairly well handled. Yeah, Under wise. 500 cases right yeah. now. Confirmed. So, yeah. so, so, I we suddenly see an, can, can the government cases. find out? You know, can the government find, mm-hmm. have an idea of opening up more for choice to Copenhagen? Yeah. And then we're closed down, and what happens then? And you know, so it's so we have an uncertain market. We have no idea how the market operates. We have no idea. It's only you know wishcraft and, and guessing. Uh, we need to be highly adaptable to that situation. Let's talk for a minute about our collaboration and. Bowline, this group we have formed, and our collaboration with CBS, yeah. and how that can help in this context of adaptation and resilience. Yeah. 
I think I, one of the key things in the long, both short term and also in the very long term is the resilience for the industry is to, for us, is to educate, mm -hmm. is to create a, a higher knowledge level in the, within the industry. And it comes from all sectors, whether you know, it's very interdisciplinary, yeah. understanding that. Um, it's for us also for future recruitment, it's about making job safety, that people don't think this is an industry where you get laid off like this, mm -hmm. and then hence we're recruiting from a, 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 a lesser, lesser you know, good base of, of, of people. Um, it's a. It, it's also highlighting, magnifying uh, the weaknesses of our industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think Bowline and this cooperation with CBS and discussions we are having is actually trying to focus on these weaknesses we already have right. in our industry. Yeah, these issues have existed better. before. Mm -hmm. but it's just magnified mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so why we need to solve that? Otherwise, down the road, we will have a very crumpled, uh, crippled industry. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, and and potentially see into you know mass chain restaurants. And the whole scene of Copenhagen has has been very small in plenty restaurants and creating a scene that also on money wise has a huge impact on the economy of Copenhagen and Denmark. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's massive numbers we're discussing about the tourism in Denmark and the culinary tourism. Yeah. Um, it's like 1.3 million people come to Copenhagen, this is a very small town, a year to eat on a high level. Mm -hmm. That's that amazing. Num that number <clears throat> was not existing 10 years ago, 12 yeah. years ago. It's something I had to learn. So this is, this is a small, but from a business model, from a small business, it's not something you really think about. But as a community, this is a huge mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sector. Yeah. Also, image-wise, uh, that other businesses fight from, um, um, uh, and not only the, the obvious ones, but for me, there's an image is, is huge because of the food sector. Well, and also in terms of, we've discussed this a lot, also in terms of what other industries can learn from you yeah. guys. I mean, if we define resilience, as we've talked about it, as the ability to respond to complexity in the present in ways that creates new capabilities for the future, you know, what we've been talking about is the way that the restaurant and hospitality industry does that in ways that can be instructive for other people. That's why it's cool to collaborate with you guys. Yeah. Yeah. It also goes into one of the things that we also discussed. We, we are fairly archaic. In the way yeah. operate, operate. I think yeah. Valley is a very, you know, mild, mild. Yeah, but there's some good to that. <clears throat> oh yes, fantastic. <laughs> no, but but when we need because we are doing that, but we do that because we very much much hands on. Yeah, it's very practical. It's very, you know, we stand here and we work and we move people, and, mm -hmm. and the whole, mm -hmm. you know, brigade of the kitchen is built on military model. Yeah, uh, but very archaic military models. So, so if you look into the military, they're actually changing their strategies how to be more adaptable in space yeah, and more better, her mm -hmm. better hierarchy. But we still be very, you know, in, 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 as, a, as a sector, we're still very you know, old school. Mm -hmm. And that's what we can learn from CPS and from interacting with other uh, sectors to understand those kind of things. Mm -hmm. And they can learn from us the way of being very practical about things and making quick changes and be very adaptable to situations. And have a you know, holistic idea about what happened on the table. Understanding people, understanding your customer, understanding your guests. I mean, you're um, being a little bit modest because the re having worked with both of you guys a lot, I mean, you guys do run your businesses and your kitchens differently and in a model that's not against the grain of the way the culinary industry works, but but clearly more collaborative than many. Yeah. Right? Yeah, so, but still, but still, we tend sometimes, you know, being a, you know, middle-aged white men tend to have still have some systems, <laughs> systematic things in this that is difficult to get rid of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. So, so for us to kind of help get get that help sorted out, how yeah. to make more better. You know, this morning that we discussed in my staff about you like having a, a hierarchy of buyers or somebody being in charge. We tried to talk about functional responsibility, mm -hmm. and and that's something which is you know you can read books about in other sectors, and you see that hierarchy is also some of, some of our colleagues have those things built in. Mm -hmm. but they're also you know twenty years older than me, so they have you know, a completely different kind of DNA going into that, yeah. um, which is good. Um, so for us to actually to adapt that, and if that could be a language of industry on a broader term, mm -hmm. it, it would raise our business model for, for the next five years. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the key focuses on doing uh, what Broadland is moving into now, is looking at that thing and, and, and collaborating with CPS or other scholars uh, or, or other industry people or mm -hmm. other sectors. Mm -hmm. I think that's the way forward for us, to be yeah. a more, you know, basically a more broad up industry. Um, <laughs> yeah. What do you think? That's true. I mean, and. I, the most interesting collaborations I've had over the last few years have actually been with people outside of the industry. Mm. Um, whether it's like a, a pharmaceutical company that's focused on enzymes that we're doing in our research space or 
a sustainable furniture company that just wanted to have a conversation and, and then we did a little dinner and talked about what we both do and mm -hmm. on that front and those have been really interesting conversations because it, it, you, you tend to kind of invert on your, especially in the restaurant industry because we, we do work a lot on yourselves and you only look at what's happening in your own industry because yeah. you think that's all that's relevant to you. And then as soon as we started this conversation with CBS, it makes you really look up and it makes you examine your industry mm -hmm. in, a, in a much more critical way. And it, all these things that, okay, that's just how it is. And that's how things are done in the industry. It questions all of those, which is a very healthy practice. Mm -hmm. You should be questioning everything you do, whether it's the right way to do it or the wrong way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, because, excuse me, edit this part out. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, but it, it, it forces you to examine all these things that you thought you were doing correctly and then really say, okay, yeah, maybe it works, but is it is it the best way to do it? Yeah. And both physically and mentally. Mm -hmm. And this, this the last couple months or few months have been a, an eye-opener to me because I very much was brought up in this like really hard military style kitchens where mm -hmm. stuff was thrown you were screamed at but you just took it that's how it was and this and you realize that the industry is changing now and you realize that you know it, it, and I'm a very open person with my team and, and it is like you said a very collaborative effort and we make all make decisions together but I certain instances I find myself sometimes retracting back to like just do it like just why are you complaining? Just do it. That, like, and, and sometimes you have to take a, and, and that just comes out without me even thinking yeah. about it sometimes. I mean, it's um, kind of understandable given in, the amount of pressure. Back in the day, no, right the now. Guy, I came in the other day and I'm just happy, you know, getting out of the office basically and we had a small chat. Yeah. And we were both so fatigued. Yeah. And one of the things also really, which, which hmm. was very clear to me uh, from the experience on the Friday service and also you, that the stress level for us right now is, 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 yeah. is crazy. Yeah. And and that good, that means that sometimes we turn into the the former our former selves yeah. of being in you know, a get the fucking things sort of I call those the dark years. And move. Yeah. The dark years. Yeah. And just move in. And, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and start moving. And and that is a, that is a normal re normal reaction because we you know we're used to that. And yeah. also moving forward and most people are actually in in very stressed situations used to that as well. So you see action. But it's not it's not a efficient way. A efficient way of doing it. It's not a viable way in the future. Guys, you both own businesses and employ people. Let's talk about the responsibility you feel toward your staff. We are part of this group called Bowline. We're collaborating with CBS to figure out the way that we can leverage uh, the challenge of the COVID crisis to generate new types of learning and collaboration. But one of the key issues we clearly of relevance, both to CBS and to the industry is all the people working over there in that kitchen and all the people you guys employ. How did you approach taking care of them when this all started? <laughs> well, <laughs> your initial reaction is to, when we first shut down, you're like, okay, everyone's being forced to take their holiday because um, we don't know what's happening. We're not in a place financially just to keep paying people. So initial reaction, everyone's on holiday, like forced holiday. Mm -hmm. um, and then that'll cut into your holiday pay. And I, I'm very fortunate that everyone's like, yes, we understand what's happening, we'll take it. Then the government started to come out with a bit, saying, okay, we're gonna have packages. Mm -hmm. um, so then we started, and, and then the first two weeks, all I was focused on was the step. How do we maneuver this with the staff? How do we keep them informed? How, how do we how do we let as few people be collateral or become collateral damage? And how many people possible? we talk about for you? For for well, before COVID we had twenty two employees, and after COVID we have fifteen employees. Mm -hmm. um, and so you you kind of have those converse. It was also the most surreal. I, I've never let someone go that was not being let go in anger I would say mm -hmm. or I would say in anger but like as in like they were doing their job and it was like a, it was it, there was no guilt behind letting someone go and that process was really difficult wow because you're looking at people in the eyes that you that have worked for you that you really respect that that believe in what we're doing here and you're having this conversation 
basically just saying, I'm sorry. I don't know if we're, you want to talk about this. Can we talk yeah. about the shutting down of? Yeah. yeah okay. So, so the reason you let people go is because you had to shut down a business to save so, a business. Exactly. So we had two, we, we had two businesses. We had a mass and we had brought and build, which is a brewery and restaurant. And there came to a point when I was talking to accountants and lawyers where they just said, listen, if you want to make it through this, um, liquidity is king. If you want to survive and you have to choose one of your businesses, the brewery or the restaurant and Amass is, is my baby. And I've it's been around for seven years and the brewery is only a year old. So Amass was the obvious choice. And that was a decision that was also really hard because there was a lot of employees that worked at Rock mm -hmm. and Build. Mm -hmm. And how do you explain the fact that that place has to shut down in order for a master to survive and, and going through that whole process. And so all you can think about in that process is what are these people going to do next? Mm -hmm. How are they going to survive? How do we make this process as involving the least amount of pain as possible? Yeah. Um, and so we kept everyone over there on the relief package for the whole time. Mm -hmm. So that gave them a solid three months okay. to to figure something out and then we gave them a month's pay on the back side of them being terminated to mm -hmm. give and so and for me these are people that i mean people work hard in our industry and you kind of owe it to them to yes. do as much as possible um with a with a mass uh we we had to let go of a certain amount of people and the ones that stayed on that becomes your immediate your all you I mean, so much of your focus and, and your your headspace is consumed by, okay, what happens with these people over the next three months? Because yes, they're being covered by the package, but they're also just kind of in limbo. Mm -hmm. What's I mean, we're getting information that's changing so often that how do you then communicate that to your staff without confusing them? Because then the next day you're telling them something different because you're getting different information yeah. from the government. So we kind of set up this, uh, we had, um, weekly Zoom calls with um, the staff that we gave out as much information as we could uh, without scaring people or, or telling people that, okay, this could change. So, I mean, when you give information and say this could, this could change, you might as well not give the information at all because it's not really, right. it just confuses people and it makes people even more uncertain. So we just kind of gave updates as we had information and just assured them that we were I mean, Bowline was a great um, piece of, or a great piece of equipment during this process because it allowed it allowed me to communicate to my staff that we were actually working on stuff in a very aggressive manner and trying to get information not just to them but to the industry, mm -hmm. and so they were really supportive of that. Um, and it just wasn't this kind of radio silence. But there would be like two weeks where you would have conversations with the staff and you couldn't really tell them anything because you didn't have information. Um, but I think just the fact that you are engaging verbally yeah. in some way mm -hmm. puts people at ease. So that that showed that really this process really taught me about communication and, yeah. being, and being open with your staff and transparent. And and as we reopen, I mean, obviously the financial situation of restaurants is, is not great. But you're asking your staff to right now potentially work more mm -hmm. and i think there comes a responsibility from your side to be transparent with them if you're asking yeah. them to make these sacrifices then you as a business owner need to make them understand why they're doing this i mean you mentioned bowline in this context one of our aspirations for this collaboration both amongst ourselves and with cbs is to use bowline to start some really frank conversations about working conditions in the industry yeah. and what types of things people should be able to expect and how they could expect to be treated. Yeah. And I got to say, I think it's really cool that you guys as owners are broaching this conversation because usually you would think that would be the other side of the aisle. Yeah. About that, but. yeah. And you have 25 staff? 25, yeah. Uh -huh. um, yeah, but it, it's, it's the, the first impact is like, you know, is like first aid, you need to stop the accident. Uh, make sure yeah. that you know find out yourself and i think as you has been you know brutally honest about everything you do now is, is, is key mm -hmm. uh, there's also the whole moral side of you know taking care of your stuff because uh, with, with the, that abrupt stop of, of society uh, it doesn't only impact the business it also impact lives 
Right? Do they have salary to pay their rent? Um, you know, there's so many things. Um, mm -hmm. We have, you know, uh, as you, we have staff, we also have kids and, and wives and families. We have a fairly grown up staff. Uh, we've been there for a long time. Um, so the whole kind of, you know, that first thing was just morally to make sure that they feel safe. Because if people are not safe, they can't hear you. It's that simple. It's a human condition. So you need to stop the accident. And then you can start, you know, planning your first aid kits and making sure what you do. And finding out uh, how do we actually finance that. So, um, so we've, as soon as the leave plans come out, we say, okay, then, so nobody, not, nothing's going to happen until we know what's going on. So that was the strategy from step one saying, everybody has a job until we know where we're going. Then when we start up again, then we can start discussing what we do. Um, and then we had, you know, we have you know, different backgrounds of people. Some are, you know, full timers, and most of them are full timers, and also come, some come from other industries. So we actually also help some of these guys say, okay, um, I would like to work in another sector. And we, some of them find out by themselves and we support about letting them go. But also, we haven't fired anyone. Mm -hmm. um, um, down the down the road, uh, I, I don't know where we at. In the same, we have two businesses, and, and we don't know that yet. But that's, that's nothing to do with you know, we have one or two businesses or how, how we look. I'm sure we're going to look a bit different. Um, but, but how is, is, is very much based also on having a good staff. So I think, you know, the, the moral side, they um, taking care of people, all these things are, you know, good for a business model, it's also good business. Because there's no different, there's no doubt in our industry, humans are the, the most viable resource we have. You know, produce, all that, rooms, chairs, and all that, that's very nice. But without the people contact, so we have to spend the most money on it. Yeah, we spend yeah, most of the highest cost. I, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm up to, you know, more than 50% of my, my income on, on salaries, so in, yeah. in, especially in, in lower seasons. And we, we try not to be seasonal in the way we hire staff. We have the same staff all year round. Uh, very rarely we hire a bit, but we don't fire either because we want a consistency, because that's, for me, it's a good business model. That also means on our liquidity and everything that suddenly, you know, someone's our, our share of salary is ridiculously high um, compared to any other businesses. Yeah. Um, so, but this is a key resource. So we need, we need, we have responsibility. It goes into the chart that you talked about, whether you want to discuss the business. We need, as industry uh, and ourselves, we need to take better care of our staff and take care of ourselves. And we by, by no means, I think both of us, are no means perfect people. And we have very dark spots in our minds as well as in the way we run our businesses and have hopefully learned from it. But that is key to move forward, um, is to hire that level. And basically on the bottom line is good business. Yeah. And I think that's very important to understand as well that it's not a humanitarian act. It is initially, but it's good business. Because when we are you know, asking people to be flexible and adaptive to what we talked about earlier, on, they need to feel safe about their job. Mm -hmm. They need to have, you know, not getting a you no, know, um, a fit of my imagination and suddenly get out of my house kind of they need to be safe in the contract and the basis for what we don't know our place from near day one is to have very sound contracts as a base of, of everything we do mm -hmm. and then we say you know this place of people we only use the paper if we have love respect and mutual you know that conversation is not happening then we look at the contract but the base of the contract the conversation is a sound contract that looks at uh, uh, you know uh, what do you call it um, the time of termination, um, and our case, the maternity leave, uh, witness the contract, respecting the holiday laws and right of things. And contract is always law, it's not something you see in contracts normally. So, so that's why I was discussing the charter thing because that's the base also for, for now to make people feel safe about their job, but also can see themselves working in industry for a longer time. I mean, people are going to lose their jobs a lot. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it's going to be worse in yeah, six or seven or eight months, yeah. too. Would be one thing that I that I found that I've never done before, and I wish I would have done it a while ago, is that we have become, or when we came back from being closed down, and obviously we had to rewrite our budgets for 2020 based on the new situation. And how did you do that? Yeah, it's not <laughs> possible. Do you have a budget? <laughs> we do. It's a very modest budget. Okay. <laughs> um, but one thing is because you're asking people to 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 work hard, you're asking people to make a commitment. And unless I find that, well, I have found is that unless they know why they're doing that, mm -hmm. instead of you just telling them that you have to do this, you, it, it's harder to do that. So we've, we've actually, 
um, since we've come back, been completely transparent with the staff, with our financials. Wow. And mm -hmm. just exposing that to everyone. This is what we, this is our break even. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. where we're at. This is what we need to make. This is what we spend on salaries. This is what we spend on food. So everyone starts to understand mm -hmm. the business as a whole and starts to understand why we are working the way we're working. I mean, isn't it the case that coming out of this crisis, one of the benefits is going to be that your guys' staff is going to be much smarter and better at what they do? Absolutely. Because they've just, just like the industry, they've had to adapt and yeah. learn. Right? Yeah. That's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. So it's been, a, and it's been, it, it, it's also, uh, it takes a bit of pressure off your sort of shoulder because in the past, you're just asking people to do things and they're based on you just telling them to do things. Yeah. And, and a lot of the time, there's no reason behind it. It's just, mm -hmm. this is how the restaurant operates and this is what I need you to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you start to expose those financials to people and they start to understand the business, yeah. then they start to understand the decisions that are being made. And then actually what a byproduct, which is starting to happen recently is that ideas. having ideas yeah. Yeah, that's about very cool. how to approach certain that's very situations. Cool. Yeah. And oh, we should, we should do this or, or, or charge for that or mm -hmm. take that off the of me because maybe it's too expensive to put on or just yeah. that, and it's become a really interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. thought process that's awesome. amongst the staff. Mm -hmm.